So for anyone that doesn't know you, Simon, tell us a little about yourself and who are you? Uh, well, my name is Simon Miller. I am a moron on the internet who just so happens to enjoy lifting weights and professional wrestling. And I mean, technically video games, we're talking about the YouTube stuff and how I got here and somehow has managed to take all of those, well, I guess, pastimes, hobbies, passions, throw them in a big pot and yeah, make a career for myself. I mean, content creator would be the way that it is described in 2021, but I hate that term. So I try not to do it. However, it is a very all encompassing term and I understand it. So yeah, I've been doing that for a while now. Hopefully we'll continue to do it while also now that the world is opening up again, throwing myself around a wrestling ring. So like, um, I'm sure that most people who will listen to this who know who you are probably know you mainly from, from what culture. I mean, how long have you actually been a content creator? How long has it been much, much longer than when you started at what culture? Or is it? Oh, yeah. I mean, so we're essentially in 2007, 10 years. Like it was because um, I left my, so yeah, I was working for a publisher down in Bournemouth and I left in 2011, or at least around this time, because I wanted to push videos hard. You know, like uh, it, was, it was like in 2008 when I'd stumbled across YouTube. So before YouTube had become this thing, and I was like, well, this is the dumbest thing ever. We're just going to let people upload videos, aren't we? Okay. But I thought it was fascinating. I thought, what a, I'm not trying to say that I saw the, the worth in it, but I just thought there is, it was a cool idea and I wanted to embrace it. And fair play to the current company I was at. They didn't see why I wanted to do that. I mean, they did indulge me a little bit, but not to the degree that I had hoped. So yeah, so I started making content really back in 2011. And the first off, you know what it's like, little camera, don't know what you're doing, a bunch of nonsense. And then I pretty much kept an eye out for a job where I could do it in some sense. And that's when the video game stuff comes in. That was like 2014 where, yeah, I joined a website called videogamer.com and they were well on the YouTube stuff. They were like, oh man, we love it. We love it. So I kind of threw myself into it with that. And then after doing that for a while, I love video games, but wrestling was always my sort of my biggest passion. So I was like, well, if I can sort of transition across to wrestling, that would be good. And the opportunity came up, I took it and uh, yeah, lo and behold, here we are somehow all these years later. Very surreal, I tell you. It's, it's I, I find YouTube, I, I, I'm with you in the sense that YouTube's an absolutely fascinating thing. Like, like my introduction to YouTube after the, the you know, the cat video phase that we all kind of go through. Yeah. I, I like my first year uni, I, I ran into a guy called Sean Croxton, who I at, was lucky enough to interview on this podcast and doing, you know, low budget health videos, you know, like, you know, a small whiteboard, bit of paper, drawing things. And yeah, now like, yeah. people are, you know, say making money playing video games, making money talking about wrestling. And I think it's, 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 it says a lot that I suppose you're, you know, maybe they did, but I'm sure your parents, your grandparents wouldn't have even dreamed that that would be, your, your sort of career path you know was it, was oh, it quite a was it quite a battle going into this they're not a battle but they, they, they don't get it i mean they still <laughs> don't get it to this day the question i always get is i don't know how you make money from that i'm like i can't i can't go through this again but i mean before i was doing that i was also i worked for i mean i essentially was an editor on a video game magazine and my nan couldn't get her head around that at all she was what do you mean you write about video games i'm like, just imagine like movies because if i understand movies i was like well then this is a dead conversation isn't it <laughs> so i mean they're baffled for it but i think they see how much i enjoy it and how much sort of effort i put into it so um no but they've never never was i think they would have been supportive of whatever i had wanted to do but no they don't <laughs> they don't understand it which is fine right it's a generational thing i yeah. mean the real battle when it comes to youtube is youtube itself like you know you can be riding high one week and smashing it and then the next week all of us saying like what did i do <laughs> did i write something in the wrong title why does no one like my content anymore but you get used to that after a while and you kind of realize until you get into that i always call it the 100k club when you're averaging 100,000 views a video youtube seems to take care of you then it's 200,000 300,000 and when you're kind of yo-yoing between that and other figures, yeah, it's, it, it can be a grind, but that's why you got to be passionate about it. And like I say, I really fell in love with it. It's a bit strong, but I was hugely fascinated with it back in 2008, 10, whatever. And here we are. And it's still, yeah, it's, it's a great way to make a living. I suppose is a good way to put it. I like the creativity. I like the freedom, but it is nonsense and it is stupid. So when people do look at me like that's bizarre, I'm like, it is bizarre, isn't it? But that's the modern world that we live in. I think there's, there's, there's you know, is going into something like YouTube, we say a lot of people don't understand it. And it's obviously quite a leap to go from being a hobbyist, kind of putting some videos out on YouTube whilst working for another career, you know, company to saying, well, I'm going to delve in and sort of like try and make this my career. And I, I remember you saying on a video once that you, you actually sold your car in order to have some money in the bank. So you obviously went pretty all in on it. And considering you just said this is a, an up and down industry, what, what is it that made you either take the leap or gave you the confidence that this could work? 
Uh, well, it was in 2016. Yeah, I, again, I was working for the, the video gamer website and I kind of felt like I'd done all I could there. You know, you always get those kind of feelings. And I just I thought I'd go out on my own and sort of, you know, set up my own um, or freelance company, self-employment company, whatever we're going to call it. I don't know whether or not there was anything that happened that made me want to do it. But it was more like, you know, I talked to the people at Video Gamer and said, well, maybe I could freelance to you in the interim while you got some more people on. I was also doing stuff for What Culture. I also had my own channel going and there were a few other opportunities flying around. And so I kind of just looked at it and I was like, well, what's the best way and the best legal way to continue this monetization process? And it, that, that was the way to do it. So yeah, me selling my car was just me trying to be smart. Like it was, okay, what, what, what do I have in terms of collateral that actually is worth something? And it was, it was pretty much it. So I wasn't going to sell in my guitars. Screw that. So I was like, I'll sell. Because I've never been a big car guy anyway. So yeah, I sold my car. I put a few, because then I thought you could put a few thousand pounds in the bank. And then there you go. You've got some money. That's your investment, right? So if all goes wrong, you've got a couple of months worth of worth of money. And I bought myself sort of the most, which I still drive today, because again, I just don't care about cars. Bought myself the biggest runaround you can you can imagine. But that and that's because, again, I'm a goal-orientated, focused person. So it was like, well, I don't, the car is not part of the the target like it's irrelevant that's there to get me from a to b so it can it can go right out of the door and it was really really hard like the best advice i ever got was you know hold your nerve because i went through some months where you know the money i was taking in wasn't even as much as my rent and you start thinking oh crap what have i done here but yeah you know someone told me to hold my nerve if you want to do it keep doing it and i had a few friends who were like oh Miller, you, uh, you know you shouldn't blah 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 they're just looking out for me i get it but because i didn't want it's twofold. I didn't want it to fail, but also this is what I wanted to do. So I wasn't happy to just sort of you know, fall on my sword. Like, oh, well, I gave it a go for a few months. I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to put in the graft. And now, yeah, it's five years ago, I suppose, in October. And it's more or less going okay. Again, I'm never going to trust it entirely for the reasons you just outlined. But that's half the fun of it as well. Like the whole seat of your pants thing. It's not for everybody, but I think it keeps me motivated. And it keeps me focused and it keeps me on point, which are all good things as far as I'm concerned. I suppose in a way, like those, those difficult moments where, it, you know, you, you say you're fine by the seat of your pants and you're never sure, you know, if it's going to go up or down, it, it keeps you pushing as well. Like it, it's a thing that keeps you driven and keeps you actually wanting to do the best content out there because you you never know what, what's going to either succeed or what's going to make things a little bit trickier, I suppose. Yeah, and that can be awful. That can be awful too. Like, you know, even sort of the last couple of weeks, sometimes you think, I want to try this video to see how it's going to do and it dies. And, oh, it's the worst. It's like, oh man. And you kind of get, even though I, I noticed this, no one actually looks at other people's views. Like you watch the video and you, you may sort of have a cursory glance at it, but you don't go, oh, that's down. Because <laughs> you don't care, right? You're there to watch the content. But there is this idea that, oh, I've embarrassed myself because this video is done. You know, it's a strange, it's a strange, strange thing. But, you know, that's the kind of, that's what you fall because when it does do well, I suppose you get that dopamine release or the endorphin release, which kind of ties into, you know, lifting weights and stuff too. It's that positive response system that your body gives you because it knows you've done something well. And I think for me, like I've always kind of done jobs that were passion first and then money second. Don't get me wrong. I want money. We want money. I'm not going to pretend I'm not that guy. Like I'm not a starving artist. Give me cash. But I'm not, I've had, I had probably two jobs which were, financially driven i didn't last very long because it's just i can't i can't do this so i think when you are driven by passion and it's no it, you know it's something that you want to do you kind of dust yourself off quite quickly and yeah surely maybe in the background you'd be like well that's crap but you just i think you have to just take it for what it is okay that didn't work why didn't it work next time and you got to be honest with yourself too like don't get me wrong the youtube algorithm is an absolute nightmare and one video that is done doing well can all of a sudden be dead in a month's time but you also have to know when it's that and you have to know when you just didn't offer up something that somebody wanted to watch. Because I always say this, what's more competitive than YouTube? It doesn't matter what time of day you upload. Uh, some people go, oh, you should upload like 11.46 because nobody else will. Yeah, but 11.46 over in the UK could be you know, 2 p.m. somewhere else, which is prime YouTube watching time. So you just have to kind of, you're kind of in competition with yourself and you're in competition with probably a billion other people. So you can't let it beat you up too much. And it's the hardest part, I think, is the grind. Like you do before you do reach this magical uh, point where you can just crap out anything, and YouTube's like send, send, send. It's it's you have to you know just go daily, and you have to just keep uploading, 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 and coming up with ideas is hard, and coming up with different ways to present it is hard. And obviously, there's 
the massive worry of overexposure, which I think everybody on YouTube is overexposed. So there are all these little things that you do have to take into account, which is why, again, yeah, put, make sure that you are enjoying yourself. But I kind of say that with everything, you know, be it the gym or whatever you're doing. If you're not enjoying something, I get not everything can go that way, but you should always be looking for ways to try and bring some entertainment back into it. Because otherwise it does become a slog. And even though some things have to be a slog, not everything should be a slog. I think I think it's that element of like enjoying the process. I know like with the, with the clients I've had the the, the best results with, they always tend to be the ones that they're always messaging, they're embracing the process, they're they're enjoying it. And yes, sometimes it's like I don't want to do this cardio session. I, I don't fancy on the gym today, but you still do it. The overarching thing is I enjoy this process, and we all have bad days, as opposed to like. I'm doing this because I see the paycheck or I see the, you know, the, the views on YouTube. So if you don't enjoy making the videos to get there, it probably won't last very long, I suppose. No, I don't think it does. And don't get me wrong, you know, some people are driven by money. But then again, that's the driving force is the money though, right? So you're not going to do something that doesn't pay you the money. I think being driven by views would be very hard because you just, you just don't know. Like you just don't know. It's too random. But I think the one thing, yeah, that you can always go back to is passion, right? When you actually love something and you want it to succeed, it does mean that you could get your ass kicked on the other end because when you are that invested and it doesn't go the way that you hoped it would, it's like, oh man, but you just have to pick yourself up. And it's, it's, so, it's so damn hard to kind of build any kind of an audience that I always talk about the numbers game when it comes to YouTube. Like let's say a video does 10,000. Actually not that great on YouTube. It's just not if we're being honest in terms of making money. But imagine you were able to sell out 10,000 seats uh, auditoriums around the world. You would be, you'd have agents and you'd have people around, you'd have an entourage. You would be a major, major deal. But YouTube has taken this idea of numbers and absolutely destroyed it. So you have to keep that in the back of your head too. Like it's not, it's not a real world. It's not a real place. And you know, a view, even though it, you know, racks up on the number counter, is only what I think it's like eight seconds you have to watch a video. It could be even less. I haven't looked in ages, but yeah, yeah it's not, it's not, it's just there's different factors you've got to take, you know, into account. And you can't just base it all on views, which is like you say, which is why the process has to be the bit that you enjoy the most. So even if you don't get super happy with the aftermath or the fallout, at least you can be like, well, hey, I had a good time. Of course, you need to make money, but that ties into you know the over that's just life sadly it's just like how do you want to make your money you got to try and figure it out do you feel like old videos so, no, I, I i don't necessarily understand the, the the views and how that sort of works but you find that old videos pick up views as you start to grow an audience because i suppose like a lot of the initial views is they see a thumbnail they see an interesting topic they don't like v shred oh i listen i listen to simon miller and then eventually they <laughs> or they come from what course you know who you are they may end up scrolling back through some sort of old stuff do you find that any like old stuff tends to pick up steam sometimes down the line i mean i don't look is the honest for that very reason because it becomes a rabbit hole and yeah. it's always a nice welcome surprise where for one reason you're like oh this video is kind of like that old one i did let me see you know how i did that to try and differentiate it and you're like oh it did you know it did all these views which is another thing as well like I would say that most YouTubers until they get super successful do sort of live and die off their 24 hour, you know, what's my video done since I last uploaded the last one. And if it's low, you're like, oh, but yet you just don't know what it's going to do. Like my channel before it became a fitness channel was just my stream of consciousness because I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. Why I didn't want to talk about fitness, I don't know, but I just didn't. And the reason I decided to start doing it is A, the pandemic hit and I wanted a new project, but also just before that, yeah, a random fitness video that I'd put up, I think six weeks prior, just got into the algorithm. And, you know, I saw all my stats going up on my back end. I was like, what is this? You, again, that's when you go through it. And that video had done really badly, but it just been put in front of the right people. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh. And it was, I think still one of the most successful videos that I've done. And that's when I thought, okay, want a new project. There's an audience for that now and a new audience, which is always good too. So yeah, you can't, sometimes you make, never a mistake, but sometimes you make a faux pas, you know, and you're like, okay, I, I didn't really judge my audience in the right way. But sometimes you've actually just created the content that when the algorithm decides this is what we're looking for is going to turn into a gem. So there is really no right or wrong when it comes to, to YouTube. It's a very, very strange, strange place. Like recently I had a bunch of um, demonetizations because somebody had watched my videos from YouTube and decided they would like, you know, violent and then you go through them you're like there's no violence in this so you're just like you know you can't win so it's best just yeah. to do what you want and, and see where you get up to but yeah that was a weird one one was domestic violence i was like what have i done so i went through this whole video 
I didn't make a joke about it. There was no footage about it. And you can't appeal the human reviews. So I don't even know what people were talking about. Wait, so I got wait. really worried then. I was like, what have I done? I don't talk about domestic violence. When, when, when probably like the most happiest, friendliest person on, on YouTube is getting domestic violence claims. <laughs> <laughs> wait, well, at, what stage, at what stage are we in the world? Like, we, you know, I, I, that's a rabbit hole for a completely other day if we start going down that thing. But yeah. like looking at sort of like, like, what I'm intrigued to know a little bit what the life of a YouTuber, what a day in the life is actually like, because good like YouTubers tend to have to do a really, really good job of making their lives look really chilled and really relaxed. You know, if you ever watch a Casey Neistat video and you just see him skateboarding down the side, but you never see him go up there earlier in the day and hide the camera in the bush so it, you know, it drives past. So what is it sort of like, like, what is it actually like? What is the real back, you know, back end of this actually look like? Well, I mean, I think it's different if you get to sort of, again, that top level, because you can then integrate a team because you'll have the finances and the reach to be able to do so. But I'm still like, I do have an editor that helps with a few videos because you just, I wouldn't be able to do daily videos otherwise. But mostly it's just craziness. You know, it's kind of this day to day or what, you know, what videos do I have to do? What topics are out there? Because you need to be, you know, you need to be reacting to stuff. That's always the best stuff is topical reaction videos where people just want to hear people talk about, you know, whether it's PewDiePie, Cristiano Ronaldo, Sylvester Stallone, you know, you name it. So there's there's a lot of sort of, you got to be fast paced with it. But for me, given that I do work for a few YouTube channels, yeah, like it's, it's kind of, it can be kind of nuts. Like I try, I try and tell people like every now and then something you're meant to do will fall by the wayside and you always get one, it's the internet, right? I get it. Oh, I can't believe you didn't do this. You're like, bro, I'll show you my to-do list today. Something just has to drop. And sadly, not even sadly, it's just the way it works. But in my world, the one thing that I can always drop is things that I am doing that aren't tied to another company because I've just upset me. And that's all right. I'm me. I understand why it had to be dropped. So I think that's that's the hard part of YouTube is that, and I, I totally understand people that get wiped out by it, which you see all the time, these stories of people being like, I just couldn't keep it up. And I'm, I got, I'm creatively... Yeah, clearly burned out, etc. Because yeah, you do. You just have to. You just have to keep going, and also you have to be on. You know, as you as you've just said there, nobody wants to, unless that's your specific channel. But few people want to turn on a video and have some morose down in the dumps. Oh, I don't even. No, they're looking for positivity, energy, and well, not necessarily that, but they're just looking for something that they can hold on to. And you know, my natural personality is that. So I'm like, well, you better turn that side up because it's going to be more transparent and honest, which I always thought was important. So. A lot of filming, a lot of looking at my own face in Premiere, a lot of scrapping thumbnails. I hate thumbnails to the bottom of my the bottom of my core. And yeah, certain days when you're just like, it's going to be difficult today because you're tired or you've got other stuff that you're dealing with and you've got to put those lights on and turn the camera on and then make it seem like you're the happiest, upbeat person in the world, which of course you are. Like Nothing serious is going on, but you're still trying to uh, push that through the camera, which on days when, yeah, you are a little bit worn out can be quite tough. But again, all jobs are tough and this is a stupid job. So I'd never complain, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't take a bit of effort here and there. Yeah, I I think it sort of goes back to that thing you said earlier about holding your nerve, and I I think that's a that's that's a, a really key thing with with any goal. And you mentioned it with training earlier on. Like I was, I had a, another episode with a mate of mine when we talked about um, the times where we almost quit being personal trainers over the last like ten years. And I, I I remember times where like I got out of a taxi, put my card you know to get some cash out for the pay the taxi driver, hit my overdraft limit. You know, yeah. like that, that non-proud moment where you have to put your head down and do a run from a taxi or every every butler in the buff job I ever took just to try and like make ends meet to keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I, I think it's like if, I, if, if a lot of people have these big dreams of doing sort of things like this, whether it's, whether it's doing stuff on YouTube or whether it's the, the things you've done with, you, with your training, I think like, I think there's a good lesson in that of just being able to just like, yeah, there's going to be, there's going to be waves in this and just knowing that where the bigger picture lies, I suppose, is, is what keeps you going. Yeah. And to accept that maybe you do want to give it up, but you're giving it up for the right reasons. You know, that's the other thing as well. Some people kind of treat quitting or, you know, ever where we want to, we want to attain to it as like they failed. And it's like, well, you have, as long as you're giving up because you 100% know that it's not right for you, then you didn't give up. You should be proud of yourself for trying it to begin with. Because not everything's, you know, you have a list as you go through life. And, you know, just as important as putting a tick next to something is being able to cross it out. Because essentially then when you get to 60, 70, if we're lucky enough to get there, you can look at that list and say, well, I don't really regret that one because I knew that it wasn't for me. Whereas if you've got a question mark next to it, you're like, well, no, I have no idea how I would have felt about it. So 
yeah, I mean, absolutely, you've got to push and you've got to test yourself. But you also have to realize if there's an end point and you're really not getting anything from it, it would be great if we lived in a society where it wasn't like, oh, well done, you absolutely you know, screwed it up. It's like, you didn't screw it up. You just don't know. And it could open a brand new door to something else. I mean, look at The Rock. All The Rock wanted to do was be a football player. That is it. Now he's the biggest Hollywood star in the world. Do you think right now if a magician said, all right, I'll tell you what, Rock, we'll go back in time and you can become an NFL player. Like, no, (laughs) I don't want to do that. What I've got is so much better. So yeah, I'm not saying we're all going to become The Rock, but it may actually lead you to somewhere where you're just a bit happier. And uh, I kind of find that with wrestling as well. I always get, oh man, I want to be a wrestler. Should I try? I'm like, yeah. It's going to suck for six weeks because throwing yourself around a ring sucks. But then after six weeks, give it another six weeks and then see where you're at. And if you don't like it, go be a commentator, go be a manager, just be a fan. That's okay. But don't feel like you not everyone is built to be a professional wrestler. That doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I always try and push that too, because well, mostly because I don't believe in quitting. Even if you quit, all right, you quit. Who cares? <laughs> what does it make your life? You do whatever you want. I think there's, I think there's two great um, parts of that you mentioned. The, the rock analogy is really, really good because it's like the amount of things that people will hold on to that maybe you must not allow them brain space to go and embark on something else, which could turn around to be the thing that that, that becomes everything to them. And if they, if they were you know not willing to let something go, then you can't really sort of like explore those things. And I think the other thing you mentioned there that's quite interesting was about almost like you talk about being a wrestler and almost embracing that first six weeks is going to suck. And I, you know, I often say with a lot of the goals, there's always that point where embracing being a bit shit is, is necessary. Because if you don't do that, like you're never going to come out the other side of it like any skill. Like I, for a little while, I do need to get back into it because I do need to get my hobbies back in check and not just work all the time. But I got into um, close-up card magic as a hobby. And oh, nice. I, I, I loved it ever since I was a kid, gave it up as a kid, came back in and was like, my goal, and I probably won't hit it now, but I, if, unless I'm really get back on it now, was to be in five years where if I said to somebody, I'm going to give up this PT lark and be a magician. I'm not saying I'd do it, but I want to have someone to go, oh yeah, that'd be a good idea, rather than just yeah. completely laugh in my face and make a bunny joke. You know, like, so, um, but that was a really infuriating hobby because the first couple of weeks you, you're learning, you, you can do three or four tricks, you show all your mates and you feel pretty good about yourself. And then the next six months, you're trying to learn something that if you do it well, no one should ever see it. So your mates go, oh, show us what you've learned the last four months. Well, if I've done it well, you shouldn't see it. And that's yeah. a really infuriating thing. And like to do that, and I suppose the same thing could in a way goes to things like YouTube, like mastering editing is like mastering all the things that shouldn't be seen. Like it should seem so seamless and you've got there's, there's hours of work that's gone into making it look so seamless. Especially editing too, because people forget videos have to be edited. And also if you don't understand editing, you just assume it's really easy. Like, cause obviously, you know, throughout my, my time, I've done the odd edit job for people as well. Not that I'm a great editor, but I'm passable. You know, I know how to put something together. And they'll just say, oh yeah, can you make like these eight changes? Like, you know, that would take seven weeks, right? <laughs> this, is, this is really, really difficult stuff. So yeah, that, that's the other thing too. It's like, sometimes you do put out a video that's maybe subpar but just because you know you just run out of time and you know and that happens which is why you absolutely need to bring in a team really like any big successful youtuber you're looking at has a team they have an editor they probably have a producer they probably have a pr guy they probably have everything you know making sure that it all ticks along and more power to them why the hell wouldn't you do that but i think when it comes to that lifestyle yeah people forget that it's not just sat in front of a camera it's then going through all the footage finding what's right finding what doesn't right and, and so on and so forth and it's you know it's it's a great thing to do, but it can be really really tough. And I know this because I've been you know I've had weeks where you're just sort of banging your head against a wall. But it comes down to that whole thing about again about making sure that you're because like people say, what should I make content about? Well, just things that you want to make content about because everything already exists. You know, like you can find, you know, South Korean kids opening toys that get like 50 million views. You're like, well, that's a very niche, a niche market there. So if that is catered for, everything is going to be catered for. So you may as well, and, and try not to copy people as well. I mean, you're going to do it at first, obviously, because it's just natural. But finding your own voice is, again, not only a really difficult thing to do, but an important thing to do so that people know what they're going to click on, right? That's the other thing as well. Do it's why when sometimes you do things that are completely out of left field, they do die on their ass because people are like, wait a minute, what? That's not really what I expected from this person. So yeah, it's it's far. It'd be great if it was just point, shoot, upload, which it can be every now and then if you come up with a good idea, but it's a rarity as opposed to the, the, the common goal. I would much rather if it was that. <laughs> that would be so much better. <laughs> Two a days. The, uh, yeah. the, 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 it goes back to the you'll be an authentic thing that you mentioned before. I think that was, it was quite interesting that you, like with, um, 
people knowing what to expect from from your channel and what content to bring up. I suppose like you going back and saying, I want to be authentic as possible and portray the, the, the me and dial that up a little bit. Does that help with sort of your content production? Because it gives you that freedom to, yeah, I can produce content that's around YouTube because a lot of people come because they know Simon Miller for Simon Miller, not the, necessarily just the topic. Um, I like to think so. I mean, I don't really have any sort of factual evidence to back that up, but I would like to think that there is something to that. Yes, because it would be backing up what you know, backing up what I, I was doing. I also think it's kind of hard though as well because there's a lot of fakeness on YouTube as well, and you can't get mad at it because people do crazy views off the back of it. So you're like, well, people are watching it, and if people are watching it and you're making a bunch of cash, you've done something right. But that just didn't sit well for me. Like I've tried not intentionally, but maybe videos when I've watched it back and thought, well, that's kind of maybe tapping into. And I just don't think they, I just don't like them really. And if I ever watch a video back and I don't like it, I don't put it up because I'm like, you should go with your gut. You know, if your gut is telling you that's probably not a good idea, it's probably not a good idea. But yeah, I mean, the, the transparency thing to me was just, that's, you know, I'm very heart on my sleeve kind of a guy. If you meet me, I'm, there's not much I wouldn't talk to you about. You know, I don't really hold back, not in a weird way, <laughs> but I'm just very open with my feelings and my thoughts. Some people like it, some people don't, which of course is their right. But, and I just, especially when it came to fitness, there was so much nonsense out there. I was like, well, I should try and marry these two things up with fitness advice that I think is good. And as I always say, it doesn't mean that it's good advice. It just means that I think it's good and you need to take that to the level that you want, but also just try and make sure that I was coming across as an honest guy. Because flub me sideways, there is <laughs> some really dishonest people in the fitness industry that just want to sell you shit and good for them as well. Do you know, like, Sometimes you do have to just roll your shoulders and think, well, if people aren't going to educate themselves, it's not great, but it's not just happening in fitness. It's happening everywhere. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to tie into that. Like anything I put out there, I want to ensure that I believe in because I don't want to dupe anybody. That doesn't sound like a very nice way to make a living. And sure, you may get a bunch of views off the back of it, but yeah, it's not, it's not, it's just not, it's just not, it's not who I am. There's a way of going about that same thing though, right? Like I, I, you, you see, Every time Vshred puts up a product, you see about 7 million YouTubers have a, have a response to it. And there's, there, I've always found there's a different, you know, there's something very, very different about the videos you put up in response to things like Vshred, where it's, it's, as you said, it's your opinion on it. And you like almost understand that he's not going to go away. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a paid model to be a front of a company. If, if he goes away, someone else will play, replace him and do exactly yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you can, I often think that you can see right through YouTube videos where you can say like, are they just trying to piggyback on his views, which almost in a way sort of makes it a little bit like what he's doing in the first place. It's like, v Shred needs to stop. And I'm, I'm like, well, you're just, you, you know you're not going to stop this. You're now just trying to get people to click on it, be that. Whereas I feel like when you've put up videos about those things, it's, it's, it's a slight refreshingness of it. It's like, right no judgment to what he's doing. This is my opinion on it. And like, this, it just, I think that it, it would make, it, it, maybe it's just my opinion, but it would just make you stay on your page much, much more. Other people have seen that B-shred thing, I've gone click, off, done. <laughs> well, I've, I've always tried to do it that way. Yeah. But then again, I've also been self-aware enough to know that, yeah, saying death to V-shred when you're making a video and getting all these views off the back of him is kind of, well, you don't want him to go away because he, you know, he brings you in view. So, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. But again, you have to admit that in the video. That's what I think, right? And I'll say it every time I talk about Bishred, I'm like, this guy is smashing it. They're making a bunch of money. And people go, oh, you're just jealous. I'm like, would you please watch and listen? Yeah. And of course, I'm jealous. Look, am I jealous of someone that makes a bunch of money on YouTube? Of course I am. But jealous, this is a whole other thing. But jealousy to me is something you shouldn't be mad at jealousy. You should be motivated by jealousy. So you shouldn't have this negative, like, oh, that person doesn't deserve to have it. You should like, no, for whatever reason that person does have it. Now, how do I get a piece of that pie? And sure, if you want to follow the same route, you can, or you can come up with your own pathway. But yeah, that's kind of like when you get people, oh, you sold out. I mean, I sold out what I did better and got a bunch of cash. That's what's like, you know, on a certain tangent, that's all that life is. And so, yeah, I don't look, I don't like the fact that sometimes people may buy a V-Shred program and realize they didn't get much out of it. But I'm also aware that that's not just V-Shred, that's just not fitness, that's the world. And I'm not going to, How I can't change that, right? I'm well aware I'm just one person in this, in this great abyss. But 
yeah, if something comes up and I have an opinion on it and I genuinely want to talk about it, the extra motivating factor can absolutely be, oh, when it's V-Shred, that will likely do well. But I think that has to be the bullet point number four as opposed to, to bullet point number one. Otherwise, you're just going through V-Shred videos and going, oh, what's he said today? What's he said today? And also, I would probably argue that V-Shred has had his time in the sun in terms of those reaction stuff. I kind of feel like, well, for whatever reason, that was sort of middle, end of last year. Everybody was talking about V-Shred and now it's kind of calmed, you know, it's kind of calmed down again, I guess, because all the opinions are already out there. But yeah, I always wanted it to come across. Like when I made that first V-Shred video, I only did it because of my own ignorance, because I was in another video. I had said, trying again, trying to get this whole point across. Don't just listen to me. Listen to Greg Doucet or Athlean X or V-Shred. I just said his name because I'd heard it in the ether. And then I had a lot of comments because, you know, you still listen to the comments to a certain degree. But like, Simon, you don't you, you don't mean that about V-Shred. And I was like, I probably should have watched a V-Shred video. And so I went to watch a bunch of them. And I was like, well, now I've got to put something up there because otherwise my true reflections aren't being, you know, aren't, aren't in the, again, being on YouTube. So I was like, well, you have to rectify that straight away. And that video just did crazy views. I couldn't believe that that was just like, wow, people hate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but again, the motivation for that video was because I screwed up and I wanted to make sure that I had uh, sorted that mistake out and it just happened to be a happy accident. And then, yeah, pretty much every video I've done after that was, hey, there was some clickbaiting in there because I remember I did one Q&A and the, first, the, the most upvoted question was, does V-Shred want to beat you up? And I was like, well, that's what I'm going to call the video. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, again, but again, the information had been presented to me, right? Like, again, it had like, I don't know how many upvotes it had, but that was at the top of the, you know, please ask me a question thing. And that's going to do better than here's how I train back. Like, no one cares about <laughs> that. So I, was, I have done things like that as well. But again, I always like to think it's, it's there for me to take advantage of as opposed to, let me scan through a bunch of E-Shred videos and try and twist something out of this because you can do it, but it just gets dull after a while. It gets boring. Like, and I get it. YouTube loves drama, but you know, that runs, that runs thin too. It really does. Unless you have a legit reason to, to bring the drama up in the first place. I, I, I always, I, I never get like why people get so angry about tick bait titles. I, I, I remember wow. sort of um, wrestle talk got a lot of slap for the click bait articles. So like a couple of years ago and they changed a lot of their content. I'm like, well, what else? Like, I, I've never looked at it and go, I'm really, the content's great and I really like the channel, but oh man, these titles really annoy me. I'm like, well, they're just trying to make money. Like, I'm going to click on them anyway. Like, yeah. you know, I think the, um, the, the envy thing is quite interesting because as a, that, that as a broader thing in terms of what everyone, you know, with, with any goal and when we get into training more later, I think this is something that, that could quite resonate with people. It's like, if you're fixated on, you can use the YouTube thing of like what B-Shed's doing, that has that wasted energy and wasted space that you could be focusing on making your channel better in the same way of someone looking and saying, that celebrity transformation is amazing. Why don't I look like that? You, that's wasted time and energy where you could be putting that into trying to improve your own set of skills. Yeah, I mean, exactly that. I, I, I don't understand the negativity of he's got more money than me or she's got more money than me or they've got a better body than me or... They do more YouTube views than I do. Well, that's regardless, that's happening. <laughs> so you can either, like you say, spend all your energy worrying about it, or you can just say, well, how do I get, you know, how do I plot you plot your own path? And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get there, but at least you've taken the first step that you have to, which is coming up with an idea and putting in the work. And hard work doesn't equal accomplishments, it doesn't equal achievements, but it does mean that classic thing, right? You've got to be on the bench if you want to get on the game. As soon as you start working hard, you're on the bench, right? Now let's see what's going to happen. So yeah, I, I just don't get it at all. And I still get it all the time. If I ever talk about anybody else negatively, and I always try to put a positive spin on it anyway. You're jealous of this person. I really am jealous of nobody. Maybe I'm envious of their success, but like I already said, I'm envious in a way like I would, I'd love to have that. Does it mean that I think I'm going to get it? No, of course not. But it means I'll use them as a template in my head to try and think, okay, well, what did they do to get it? So yeah, I don't. I'll just, I'll never understand. It just feels like such wasted time and such wasted energy. And it's a reason that I'm quite hit and miss on social media too, because most things descend into an argument about things I just don't think are that important, especially. And I'm, I mean, this sounds ha ha funny, funny, but you know, one day we are all going to be dead. <laughs> and you see people arguing about just the most stupid stuff. And I'm like, I'm not saying it's not important, but I'm saying the amount of effort and time you're putting into this especially because it's all negative energy, it's just not going to serve anyone. You're going to wind yourself up. The person you're hammering on the other end of the line, they're going to be pissed off too. So now you've got this kind of, you know, this magnetic effect going on. I just don't get it. I just don't understand it. And I'm not saying that I haven't been dragged into that. Of course I have. I'm a human being. I'm not perfect. But I always try and have the awareness 
to pull myself back out of it because I just think there's so many if you have a real issue that you feel like needs to be overcome I guarantee you it's not going to be solved on Twitter like it's just it's just not it's not where it's going to happen I think that ties into this idea of you know person x is doing well so what I will do is, is I will get mad about them doing well and I would get you know go on and blah, blah, say all this stuff and it's like you're not you're not going to get what you want from this and in fact you're actually going away from being at the starting point to where you may actually be able to get the success and it doesn't mean there aren't sort of layers within that like you know there could be a personal issue or you know I, I've been there too but yeah I just I like to think that I don't get dragged into those battles too much because it's just not worth it's just not worth it when exactly you could be working on your own video or you could be going to the gym, right? Or you could be listening to music or reading a book, doing something that actually makes you happy. <laughs> and I think people sometimes forget that really, I don't want to get too hippie trippy, but the meaning of life is, did you have a good day? Yes, well, you smashed it. Like, that's it. That's all it is. Because I understand that people sort of want to be a celebrity or they want to be famous or they want to be rich. But if you still got to the end of the day and you had a good one, it can't have been that bad. At least, and I, I get it, it's so silly and care bears, but I just, that's just why it's, this is how I see it. It's just how I see it. The fitness industry obviously is, 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 is terrible for this in a lot of ways. I, I have this like, this, this almost image in a way that all these people fighting is keto better or is carnival better. And they're, they're, they're going to be on the deathbed one day and going to go, fuck, it really was a caloric deficit, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and like, like, after all that arguing. I would just love it if there was a bit more or in there there's never an or or a maybe it's just like no you should do this and if you don't you've got it wrong and it's like okay so i did this diet for six weeks it hasn't worked for me well you were doing it wrong well i pretty much did. no it just didn't work for them because that drives me nuts too like you can say like this is the one i get all the time i cannot drink copious amounts of caffeine because i break out in my skin just breaks out it just does i'm going to assume because it puts your cortisol levels up stress hormone you're going to get spots i have people going it's not possible caffeine does not give you spots and they send me all these scientific studies i'm like that's great I wasn't in those scientific studies. So my body does not attribute to this. And I understand like the skepticism, but I have tried everything. I've done that whole, you know, introduce it, take it out, introduce it, take it out one at a time, one at a time, you dairy, gluten, blah, blah, blah. And if I have five coffees in a week, I'm going to have spots. If I get rid of coffee for two weeks, I don't have any spots. And I'm eating dairy and all this other stuff. So you're like, it has to be gone. It's just, here is my litmus test and it works. But that's when I get massively confused. I'm like, why are people on their high horses about this stuff? Like, it, it, no matter what you read, no matter what you read, you'll be able to find someone that completely circumvents the evidence because bodies are flipping weird and they're really strange, which is why, again, if, like you've already said, if Chris Hemsworth releases his diet and then you do it for a year, you're not going to look like Chris Hemsworth for the very big piece of evidence that you are not Chris Hemsworth. And then people go, oh, it's steroids or it's, PTs or it's money. Sure, those are the beneath the surface things. But the major one is that you are not Chris Hemsworth. And you just have to accept that, but they don't. And it's, it, this goes back to what we were just talking about. Oh, if I did steroids, I look like this. If I had his money, I'd look like this. You probably would look better than you do now. Yes, you just would. <laughs> but it's not the answer. It's not the answer. That's not the problem. The problem, it's not even a problem. That's not the, it's just nothing. You're you, he's he. Deal with it. It sucks. Of course it is. I wanted to be Ronnie Coleman when I was a kid. I used to go, Ronnie Coleman said, that's what I want to look like. Guess what? Nowhere near. And it's never going to happen. And it's not going to happen probably for anybody again ever because he was a genetic freak. But yeah, it, it's really... Because you think the fit, fitness is such a positive thing. You think that people would love to just throw it out there. Oh, man, you know, I did the carnivore diet. You should give the carnivore diet a go. Oh, I did, tried it, but I'm into keto. And they'd be like, oh, sweet keto. But they're not like, keto, moron. And it's like... <laughs> I think that a lot of people look at what's what, what is different in all these diets and rather than looking at them as okay what's all the same and like you know I see all the times like this person was on carnival diet and no caloric deficit they lost weight I'm like ah, ah let me stop you right there like no no the caloric deficit was there the carnival stuff could be great but like, they all share this thing now let's find out which of these methods to skin a cat is the best for that person in front of you and I and going back to the the, um, the research and the studies thing like there's a big trend that you know these days with the evidence-based crowd in the fitness industry and like I, there's, a, there's a great mentor of mine called Luke Lee and he says he's not evidence-based he's evidence-informed and, and I, I, I love that in the sense of like a lot of the people that are evidence-based they don't know how to read a paper for a start and they'll take a, a conclusion on PubMed and be like that is fact and and, <laughs> and understand like, like I, I haven't read these studies that that 
disprove caffeine as a thing that comes out with spots, but like knowing a little bit about the physiology of stress and just learning about, okay, if your nervous system and you're in a big, you know, high stress fight or flight response and you're constantly in a mode of running away or kicking something in the dick, it's going to shift blood away from the digestive system. It's going to shift blood away from things like the immune system. So I can totally see how like your skin's not going to be looked after. I don't need a study to make, say, to put two and two together and go, okay, maybe, maybe that is a, you know, a, a genuine thing. If it works for you, then do you know what? Let's not have coffee in your diet. Like try and put a square peg into a round hole. Yeah. I mean, exactly that. And the whole study thing is crazy because you can find a study for anything. I've done it. I've done it. You can find a study for soy increasing your estrogen levels. You can find a study for soy not increasing your levels. You can find someone that goes, I don't know, I tried all this soy stuff and it doesn't happen. But you still get the, not my term, internet term, soy boys, you know, going out there and flaming anybody that dares say anything else. It's like, why do you even care, man? Who gives a crap? Like, it doesn't matter. But I've kind of, that's the one thing doing the fitness YouTube stuff has learned is that some people have decided they have, you know, unlocked Pandora's box to how to get in shape and they won't hear you know, they won't hear anything else. I'm like, okay, man, do you know what? You don't have to, you know, you don't have good for you. If you are convinced that this is the way it's a bit annoying because you shout at everybody else. It'd be better if you were a bit more understanding, but good. Honestly, I respect you. Awesome. Enjoy, enjoy your fitness journey, but I'm going to ignore you because I know how, you know, I know how dumb it is. I know that I have, you know, I've had personal trainers, you know, smart, really intelligent people that have given me diets and trades. It doesn't work. It doesn't work like this is whatever we've decided to do. I look a lot worse, man, because that's for whatever reason, my body was like, I don't like the way, you know, the way that we're doing this. And it ties into abs as well. Like, you know, because abs are the big thing, but, you know, percentage of body fats. And some people cannot believe that you can get some people that actually have quite, not super high body fats, but relatively high in comparison. And you can see their abs. Like, well, I'm less body fat. I can't see my abs. I'm like, yeah, you pulled the short straw. <laughs> unfortunately yeah. and your mate pulled the excellent straw where he could walk around and it just but then that's oh no no it's this and it's that it's like you've just got to take it for what it is don't worry about what it is and don't worry about what it's not worry about what it is for you and figure out what you have to do to get there and if it does mean you have to drop a couple more percent body fat to see your abs and you think that's the most important thing then that's what you've got to do or if you'd rather throw your face into a pizza, you've got to do that as well. But understand that there's consequences on either side. You know, it's not this amazing one-stop shop. I would love it if it was a one-stop shop. You could buy one health magazine ever and frame it. And that's all you'd ever need to do. There wouldn't even be a fitness industry. Because you'd be like, well, no, we just we just go by these 10 rules that what that guy wrote one time. But it's never going to be that way, especially because it is a science-based sport, hobby, whatever we want to call it. So I'm sure in 20 years' time, much as we do now, we're going to look back and go, oh, that was stupid. Look at all that dumb stuff we were doing, you know. But even then, people will still moan and complain and, and, and shout. And it's a shame because, again, yeah, fitness is such a good thing to get into. And then when you kind of dip your toe into it a little bit further, all of a sudden, like, you know, you cannot post any kind of workout video. Your form's wrong. Your form's crap. Run, run, run. It's like... Ah, unless I'm literally taking the bar and smashing it into my head maybe <laughs> this is just the way that I train that feels comfortable to me and I understand that's a little bit more uh, science based again because you know you can maybe spot little things but I have found that as you do build up these little niggles and injuries that you have in the gym you do kind of have to you know I'm going to move this knee here I'm going to put this elbow there sure by the textbook it may be saying don't do that but we beat ourselves up and if you want to keep training sometimes you just need to kind of shift shift those rules a bit but you're not allowed to do that dare how dare you do a bench press that wasn't exactly like a robot on the internet now i will tell you what a goof you are it blows my brain it really does but luckily i'm quite thick skinned so i also find it very amusing otherwise i don't know how people do it i think i think with the guy with the these the form stuff as well people often don't like taking advice unless they ask for it and like we look at this there's a there's a big trend that's actually now going towards the, the biomechanics sort of world and and like i'm i've gone down that wormhole massively a number of times and I, i've seen people that apply it like really really well and get the best of the clients and i've seen people that now think their active range is one inches of range of motion and now because they've, they've, <laughs> they've got scared by everything but you, there's a trend in all the people that teach this stuff, you know, including myself and our mentoring trainers, is that we've all done the other stuff that we shouldn't have been doing, got broken and gone, there must be a better way of doing this. Yeah. And I see a 20-year-old doing straight barbell curls, and I'm sitting there going, maybe I should tell him his elbows are going to be trashed when he's 35. <laughs> he's 21 years old. He just wants to get laid. Like yeah. he, he doesn't care about his elbows right now. He's invincible. 
It's, it's like trying to tell a 21 year old going, you should track HRV. It might stop you getting a heart attack at 45. I'm like, I'm 21. <laughs> I want to get laid. Like I said, drink alcohol. That's all I want to do to look good for the beat. Yeah. I mean, it ties um, into wrestling. I mean, it does tie into wrestling as well. You know, all these old rookies tell wrestlers that are flying around the place, oh, you're going to regret it. They're not going to listen to them. Because of course they're not. And especially with the, the, the straight arm uh, barbell curl makes me laugh because I every now and then, if like all the other bars are being used, I will do a straight arm barbell curl, but I would do it completely like nothing on the bar. Do you know what I mean? I literally use it as like a finishing exercise. And I always get someone coming up to me go, what's a waste of time? I'm like, man, I will nut you. Like, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I literally, I haven't forgotten to put plates on. It's because I feel like I haven't done enough and I want to finish it off. So I am protecting myself as much as I can, but they just see no weight loser. You're like, oh man, you dry. I can't, that does get to me because You've actually you've actively gone out there, learned from your mistakes, and you're trying to make sure you don't rectify it again. And then some dude who thinks he's knows better will just go, nope. It's like, why are you talking to me? Go train, shoe, get out of here. So what's like like oh you mentioned a number of times being very, very topical on your channel in terms of the, you know, what's new in fitness world and all this sort of stuff. But what's some of the maddest sort of fitness, whether it's products or trends that that you've struggled to get your head around that you've done a video on? Dry scooping. <laughs> <laughs> dry scooping <laughs> pre-workout when people just take the powder and put it in their mouth twofold one <laughs> they don't understand that you know a lot of the chemicals in there are meant to interact with water to basically turn them on right i'm not going to pretend i know the super duper science but i do know there's things in there that are done so they also damage you less but also become more potent also two the people that you will make these videos and go no you're wrong simon you are meant to you are meant to just eat the powder then why doesn't it say that on the back of the box <laughs> why does it say dilute it first also let's say that i'm wrong and you do get more power i don't know what the right word would be from from dry scooping what are we talking about four percent max so you're happy four percent you think that's gonna make a difference to your stupid physique i don't get it and then you find all these stories guy dry scooped ended up in hospital dry scoop fell on the floor dry scoop got a migraine for three days you're like mm, i don't read much about this with people that are just drinking it normally and don't get me wrong i have a i admit admittedly i'm part of the problem when it comes to normal pre-workouts because i can't believe some of them actually exist when you actually look on the back line, it says caffeine, 900 milligrams. Like, who, who, who releasing this? Why does the government not care about this? But they're worried about taking my junk food off TV at 9 p.m., whatever the hell they've done today. <laughs> you should be more worried about that because, again, talking about the young guy that has no idea, you know, you should be slamming. I think the most I ever saw in one was like 500 milligrams. Me personally, I don't think you should be slamming back 500 milligrams that quickly. If you have it throughout the course of a day, yeah, you're probably going to be fine. But to throw it back, it just seems nuts to me but again some people are going to tolerate it more than others but yeah dry scooping is completely absurd <laughs> it's like, I guess like an old man but it's true yeah. and I get that it gets you TikTok views but this ties into the conversation we were having earlier I understand that it will get you a certain amount of notori notoriety but is it worth it for the influence that you may have on other people like if someone said Simon I guarantee you this food is going to do 10 million views but a hundred people that watch it are going to drop down dead. I'm, I'm not making that video. I'm not saying that's what's happening, but I'm saying that is the, you have to be, look, I am a tiny, tiny YouTuber compared to, to some, right? But you still have to understand that your content will be watched by some people who take it as read because they just will, because they are looking for the answer. And if they never heard it before, they go, oh, that, that's what I've been getting wrong, right? It's why, you know, men's magazines have sold for, you know, however long they've been selling for. So we know the secret and you, buy, and you even I buy this thing. And the secret, what is it? Oh, it's like l cartonine. You're like, <laughs> magazine. but yeah, I just, I don't get it. But you're not going to change these things. I, I, I think because when I started lifting weights, fitness was not cool. It was not popular. It was bizarre and weird. And what do you mean you're drinking powder out of a pot? Whereas now it's very trendy and very cool, right? So I suppose this is really the first wave of people trying to do this stuff to exploit social media. And it kind of sucks because I think people forget that fitness is about health and it's not about sort of, look, I love a good pump in the gym, but it's not worth, it's just not worth it if you're going to damage yourself. It's just not, it, that's not why we're going to the gym. Like we're going there to make ourselves feel better. So yeah, dry scooping is, is a difficult one. Um, any kind of thing like that, just make any stupid fitness equipment. Like I saw the other day, one of those stupid freeze belts, 
that you know freezes your fat off but look oh. again i'm sure the science is a hundred percent true but not once do they ever mention but you have to eat well and you probably have to do exercise this is like a supplement to everything else you're doing now they go no this is get rid of all your fat you can just sit there watching tv and eat whatever you want and you're like kill me like what it's just too it's just too much but i mean that comes down to my whole almost ethos with fitness is that we should be educating people which again you know in the uk they've just announced no junk food adverts before 9 p.m you think that's going to stop people wanting junk food of course it's not i mean well, so so let's say we advertise I, I don't think tomato sauce would count as junk food i don't know so what if someone now eats eight tomato sauce bottles a day i guarantee you they're gonna start putting on some weight because they, no one's taught them about calories and no one's taught them about how food works and proteins and carbs and fats. They have no idea. But I know someone, and I won't out them because it's not fair. They are not old, but adult men who didn't know that sugar was carbohydrates. They were doing a no carb diet and they put sugar in their coffee. And I don't judge them for that. They just didn't bother to look. And I'm like, well, if you don't know, you don't know. But the fact we're always so, we're always aiming for the, what's the easy pathway? We'll take adverts off TV. We'll release a freeze belt. So, no, no, to me, and maybe I'm being, once again, old man. Nutrition should be taught in schools. I think that should be on the agenda. I'm not saying it has to be an hour-long class, but it should be, this is what a calorie does. This is what, you're, you know, this is what happens when it goes in. This is what fat does. And I, I just think that would help. Because when do you not eat? <laughs> the one thing we all do is eat, and yet no one ever... Exp they may explain it sort of in passing in a biology class or something, but it's... Look, I don't ever remember anybody telling me about that. And I remember having to do a hell of a lot of studying after the fact to try and to try and figure it out. But that's not going to change because it takes too much money. It takes too much effort. But that's, again, we don't need to go down that route at all. I, I think like with, the, with, with nutrition in schools, like I remember my nutrition in schools was literally just making bread and, and, and not, a single, yeah. not a single bit of education about nutrition and calories. And, I, and I've met tons of people that, that aren't aware of that. And I think it, there's a lot of things of like, it's it's, almost punishing the people that are educated with it. Like if we're banning the junk food adverts or they, they had like the sugar tax, which is it really about the food people's health or is it really about trying to add more money to buy a chocolate yeah. bar that's now half the size? Because like I, I, you should not be punished, someone who's done bodybuilding shows who's been in shape that is on YouTube talking about fitness to if you want to buy a Galaxy, you shouldn't have to pay 50p more for it rather than educating the people that, that that's better. The same block with junk food adverts. I mean, what do we class as junk food? Is it anything calorie dense? Does that mean yeah. we can't advertise nuts? Because they're going to be calorie dense the same way that some sugary thing would be. But yep. like this, this line stops got to stop somewhere. We're now getting to a world where people are going to be scared of food just because they're it's it's good versus bad rather than like let's let's no, let's stop. Yeah. And also for me, like given how I know how my body responds to it, if right now you said, Simon, do you want some pasta or you want a chocolate bar? I take the chocolate bar because pasta just bloats the hell out of me. <laughs> you know, so I don't enjoy it. I, I like having it here and there. But for me, if I was going to have a treat, I would take the chocolate bar because I actually know, given how much pasta I would have, I'm going to get way less calories. And also, you know, I can't, remember the, I can't remember the name of the thing now, but pasta is one of those foods that doesn't fill you up that much, you know, on that bizarre scale that they've got. And again, that's going to be different for each people too. But I know the chocolate bar, I'm going to have one. And because I barely ever eat chocolate, I'd be like, man, I don't want to eat anything. <laughs> that was, you know, that was a lot you know, all at once. But the pasta will be on the TV because pasta is considered healthy. And it's not unhealthy for you. Well, this comes down to the whole carbohydrate argument, doesn't it? I mean, I mean, Boris Johnson, when, during the pandemic, he did some video where he was all like, oh, I've lost all this weight because I dropped carbs and I wanted to put my fist through the TV. I was like, that's so, so bad that you've just said that. So you've just continued to demonize carbs as this thing that we're not allowed to eat. And even a chocolate bar, the demonization of the chocolate bar, for goodness sake, you're allowed a chocolate bar. Don't you know, you just have to make sure you're not having... Sorry? Don't forget to eat out to help out, you know, oh, like, you know, yeah. wash your oh, carbs. <laughs> I know, I know. But it's just, you know, I, I hate all of that because... As soon as you start telling people you're not allowed the food that you like, it was like when your girlfriend or your boyfriend bakes up with you, right? What do you want to do? You want to get back with them because they broke up with you. As soon as you tell someone they're not allowed it, they want it twice as much. Whereas you can say, hey, man, here's a Mars bar. There's 150 calories in it or whatever the hell it is. I don't know. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. Make your choice. You know, <laughs> Make your choice. And then you wouldn't do it with anything else, right? You wouldn't go into anything anything blind like well, i was about to compare it to the supplement industry that's not true people just throw supplements down their mouth as well but personally speaking i think that you should take ownership over what it sounds so cheesy but true ownership what you put into your into your body and i'm not saying that it's good to be obese 
because obviously it's not and also it puts a strain on the national health service over here in the united kingdom which is bad because if somebody's got i don't know cancer or you know some kind of blood disease i don't know whatever something serious and they can't get a bed because it's just easier to tackle obesity than something like cancer because where does it come from where does it go right but at the same time you have to let somebody have that choice and the best way to do that isn't by taking adverts off television it's by saying hey you need to learn about this stuff you just do because nobody knows what calories is nobody absolutely nobody understands and that's why like you say you mentioned nuts people eat nuts because they've been portrayed as healthy which they are but flub me the calories in them are insane like i remember it's way way back when i had fallen into the same trap i was oh yeah nuts 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 and then one day i happened to look up the calories i was like i I don't eat nuts anymore (laughs) because there was just so many other foods i could have in huge portions that replace the calories from nuts and i get they've got healthy fats in them but there's way too there's loads of ways to get healthy fats in your diet without without eating nuts but again we have just decided as a society oh nuts nuts good cheese bad (laughs) that's it that's as far as it goes whereas you could probably i think some of the uh, packet nuts that you get i think you could eat half a block of cheese and these less calories because those they're huge nuts things and people just oh mom eat 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 because they have they have no idea and i don't blame them but i don't i yeah i don't like the way well my big thing is just education it always has been i mean there's no point pretending otherwise you go on my channel for eight seconds and you'll find a video of me ranting ranting and raving about it but yeah i don't think we should be i don't think any kind of food should be should be demonized because i mean the whole cheat meal thing we can go on for days about but there is a reason to have one And I think for people that aren't necessarily super intelligent when it comes to diets, because they're only just still learning, you certainly shouldn't be getting across the fact that you can't have a nice meal here and there because they're going to hate their lives and they're going to hate their diets, which is the one thing you don't want to do. You know, you want to make sure people fall in love with this stuff and they do it forever. I, I, I completely agree with you about the, you know, education is as our way forward. I mean, I'm, I'm on a, um, like a business mentor group with a number of personal trainers. And the biggest thing that comes out in, in the questions about not getting able to get the client's results is that the, the adamant they're on 1200 calories and they're not losing weight, 150 kilos. And like, and it's because of these things, it's snacking and not, not being aware of it. It's, oh, it's only small. But I always think if it's something I've done when I've been a diet, my clients do it much worse. And I always remember when I last um, photo shoot prep that I did, I had these little low calorie dairy triangles, like 20 calories in one. And I had like three of them to get me between meals. And like, what, 60 calories a day? That's nothing. I didn't track it. Maybe I should have done. But that's what my clients would do with a cookie. They go, oh, it's only a cookie. But it's three, three cookies, seven days a week. It's all 230 to 300 calories a piece. Yeah. And now I, I think, you know, it's the answer is, as you say, it's education. Like I always call it like a Snickers bar analogy. A Snickers bar isn't necessarily bad. If you have 2,000 calories a day and you realize the Snickers bars, 400 calories, but you also realize a whole plate of chicken, broccoli, and avocado is 400 calories. I can then go, well, if I have the Snickers bar, it's nice, but then I've got to take this away and I'm going to be a bit hungry. Am I okay with being hungry? Yes. All right. Enjoy the Snickers bar. Or, do you know what? I don't want to be out hungry. I'd rather have this. And now it's not, coach told me not to have the Snickers bar. It's, yeah, yeah. you know what? I, I, I don't fancy it because I've weighed up the pros and cons like an adult rather than insulting our intelligence going, no, you can't see Big Mac. Because like that, like it just insults everybody involved. Yeah, no, it really, really does. And that's the idea of sort of showing people the difference in calories, I think is is so, so important because then you can make proper choices based on what you are and what you aren't allowed to do. But yeah, as soon as you tell somebody, no, no, that's it. I want it. I really, really want it. And this idea, because it ties into this idea about hunger as well. When you break it down, and I'm talking about, first world hunger not third world hunger that's terrible but i'm talking about i've had more than enough food for the day and i'm hungry so what (laughs) do you know what i mean i'm not saying it's not hard cravings are the worst they send you nuts but we have turned hunger into this monster like what pill can i take that suppresses appetite how do i get rid of hunger sometimes it's just to go i'm hungry are you gonna eat nope (laughs) that's it (laughs) that's it that's as far as it goes but i'm not putting that on anybody i'm putting that on the way that again the fitness industry to sell you stuff has thrown it out there the hunger is this monster hunting you down no it's not it's just your body saying i'd like some food doesn't mean that it's always right you have a fast metabolism and blah 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 etc etc but no now it's this terrible thing that we must fend off at, at every every opportunity and, and also i mean the amount of 
And why would they know? Again, I don't want to feel like I'm pointing the finger at anybody here. But that whole point that the reason people want junk to begin with is because you get a chemical release before you eat it. You know, which is why you feel so crap afterwards because those chemicals are gone, but you've just have eight Big Macs down your down your throat. Look, I love junk food. Of course I do. Who doesn't? Like, you know, I think people that go, oh, I don't eat junk food. Yes, you do. Don't. You're not an alien. You're still a human being. But like you say, it's when you actually lay it down there and I think, okay, do I want this nice bowl of oats with fruit in it and, I don't know, eggs and chicken sausages and can avocado, which is going to be like, you know, 700, 800 calories. Or do I want a McDonald's? It's going to be 2000 minimum probably with all the stuff that it comes with. It's like, I want the other one. It sounds nicer and it will last me longer and it will fill me up, get rid of the dreaded hunger bug. But no, people have just been taught McDonald's bad. Yeah, nuts good. So it's just like, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do that as well. And you could lose, you can lose weight eating a McDonald's. You had one McDonald's a day and you're smashing in the gym. You're going to, you're going to lose weight, but maybe horrible. But oh, yeah, <laughs> so terrible. No, I mean, yeah. McDonald's is a weird one because I can't even remember the last time I had a McDonald's, but I've never had a McDonald's that filled me up, which is very weird. It's a very, very strange fast food. Like, if I have a KFC, I feel full. But if I have a McDonald's, I'm like, I don't know, air. It's like they just injected air into that stuff. It's so weird. Like, hunger, hunger's a, you know, say you're right, it's an interesting one. I think um like it's a Craig Barantai says never make a poor life decision when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Hell and yeah. I think hungry is an interesting one that it's hunger is as much habitual than it is actually something that's actually true. And like, yeah. like don't be wrong, we can look at someone's food volume, we can talk about like that Snickers bar thing, Snickers bar's not gonna fill you up, you know, bulking out your meals are. But most people, when they talk about like hunger, they'll it'll happen on a diet and they forget that they chose to put themselves on the diet. Yeah. So it's like, like it's okay to be a bit hungry, you've chosen this. And a lot of times I've seen people go, they're not hungry they're really full and they go right you start your diet and in a second like oh, i'm really hungry i'm like it's been an hour like, <laughs> <laughs> like and it's this habitual this mental like i'm dieting i must be hungry yeah um and i thought that transitions nicely into a little bit of going into your training history you know rather than just the nest of the youtube stuff and starting off a little bit in terms of the the, the bodybuilding stuff that you did you did your your bodybuilding show a few years ago like Regard to that, obviously there was peers on you must have had things like hunger. Like, what did you learn from going through that process, and how did you sort of approach that prep? I learned there's the hardest thing in the world that you could probably do, like in terms of that avenue of stuff. Absolutely, and there's nothing, especially because obviously you throw, you know, your endocrine system just goes. Well, listen, bra, if you're going to screw me over, I'll screw you over right back. And that's another thing that I think people should be more prepared for. Why am I crying now? Oh, that's right, because my hormones are all over the place because I'm starving. It was a weird one. It was kind of like, yeah, incredibly hard, but it's so rewarding too. Like I absolutely, I remember that. The one overwhelming factor I have from that show is I had a smile on my face throughout the entire thing. I loved the process. Uh, I was by no means in the best shape there either, which is weird for me because I'm quite a competitive guy. Not like angry competitive, but if I put myself up for something, I throw myself into it. But it was that's when I kind of learned it wasn't about that next time if i ever did it again it would be because you go you got your first one out of the way now it's time to take it serious and you learn from your mistakes i made a hell of a lot of mistakes as you're going to because you don't know what's going to happen but yeah i remember i had a smile on my face the entire time wasn't that nervous which was not because i didn't care but because i was having fun you know i was enjoying prancing around in my little pants and yeah and what it absolutely taught me i think more than anything strangely was not to worry about the scales as much as as I used to because I, I I just I, I so used to be mass strength you know when I was sort of younger like oh you need to weigh 18 and a half stone to be a big guy based on what probably because some wrestler weighed that and I, it wouldn't even been true because it's wrestling and they lie about their weights <laughs> but I remember I, I remember how much weight I actually had to lose in order to get down to sort of I mean I don't I never I didn't test my body fat I probably should have done but I was probably down to sort of six five mm, that's probably too low Six percent ish, I would guess, you know, randomly. Still low, right? I, I I say to anyone, you get below 10, you've done a good job. I mean, it's probably not going to win you a bodybuilding contest, but in terms of your own challenge, fair play. Pretty incredible, below 10% body fat. Yeah, and I remember how much weight I had to lose to get down to that. I was like, man, that's way more than I thought. You know, I thought you'd you'd lose a stone and you'd be there, but it's not a t well, it depends where you start, of course. But you know, I was more of a bulky guy, lifted weights. 
again, just wanted to look good in a jumper, right? That was my big thing. I don't care about abs. I just want to look massive in a jumper. Not that I was fat, but my stomach was flat, but you could probably see the indentation of abs. But yeah, you know, it was it was not my focus. So yeah, the amount you just have to strip away in order to start seeing those siration in your abs and and everything like that was crazy. And again, yeah, just the sheer hell you put your body through those last those last couple of weeks. I just, yeah, I'll never, I'll never be able to get over. I remember either Wednesday or the Thursday before my show and I just sat there. I was just miserable. I was just a miserable, miserable human being. Like, this, this isn't good. And yet when I got to the Sunday, the day after the show, I thought, oh, maybe I'll do another one. And I think that kind of, you know, it, it underlines how, I suppose that's just what your body rewards you with. It knows that you've put yourself through this stuff and you did it controlled and you did it smartly. It's not like you were putting yourself in danger or anything like that. I think I would have, I needed to be better prepared for the sheer sugar craving after the fact. I absolutely did the whole uh, binge that people do because, you know, your brain starts screaming out. I don't know what that was, but I want you to eat all of it because you took it away for these 12 weeks. But again, that's just what you learn, isn't it? And the best thing about a bodybuilding show is you can have, you could probably put in 5,000 calories away in an evening and yeah, you're going to be bloated for a few days. But as long as you take your foot off the gas, again, you're sort of in those subpar body fat levels that you'll be all right but uh yeah that, I, I shouldn't have done that that was i didn't eat that much I, I ate too much for where i was at the time but i didn't realize i was going to enter this i almost felt like it was an out-of-body experience and somebody else was just eating for me i was like, i don't even want to be eating anymore what am i doing but no i loved it and i think at one point i will do another one uh not not for a while because there's other things that i want to focus on for now but um yeah i i love the challenge i love putting your body through that kind of change and I remember yeah, the coolest thing was as well when you are sending your progress pictures and you compare it for sort of six weeks prior. And, you know, especially when my legs started to come in, you know, I never actually thought my quads were any good. But actually when my quads came, I was like, oh, quads are all right. Hamstrings suck and calves are no good. But my quads, <laughs> my quads are all right. And that's great. Like it, it feels like a real pat on the back for everything that everything that you've done which is really hard when you're lifting weights because you're so picky all the time you know that doesn't look really that doesn't look very good but when something actually does look good you're like oh man i'm gonna keep doing it so yeah i love the process love the journey and i would recommend anybody that goes to the gym just to do it once just enter one of those first timers where 100 people will turn up and you'll all be thrown on stage some people will look like they never lifted a weight in their life other people look like they've been doing it 100 years you're like how the hell do you look this good but it's yeah it's a great day and i i really did enjoy it yeah, I, 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 I mean, I've, I've gotten like stage lean and never want to get on stage. I admire anyone that, that does it. I just, li little pants and Ron Seal was never my idea of a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> oh, I hate the, the tan is awful. I hated the yeah. tan, yeah. Although, having said that, I mean, I've done plenty of photo shoots and the tan was just as dark. I, I, remember, <laughs> I, I, I remember like um, a shameless plug for a guy called James Harkner. James Harkner says it's a tan guy in London. He might actually listen to this. He won't mind me saying this. He is the most amazingly camp tan man you'll ever know in your life. And you almost want to go back for the compliments he shows you. Like, I, was, I was there and he goes, you have a model for men's health. I'm like, no, because we're really good at it. I'm like, can I get one of these every week? You know, I, yeah. I remember like, you know, he wants to do the under on my arm, and it wasn't just like, could you lift this? It's like, could you lift this? And like, for the people listening to this on audio, this is a full on full body swish. Um, <laughs> but like, like I, I always think, as you said, like, as you said, that getting, I think everybody at least once in a while should tick the box of getting really lean like a few percent leaner than they maybe want to stay because yeah. they know they can do it they know what they're capable of and i think it's a shame to never do it and it's interesting to talk about the, the things you learned through dieting and the times you felt rough like i i never got those but i definitely got my brain doesn't work on low calories there were oh, times yeah. I, I lost my passport um on the day i was supposed to fly out to marbella thankfully someone found it and messaged me on facebook i um lost my um I, no, I left my iPad on the train. Thankfully, got that back too. I put water in the coffee machine uh, where the beans should go. Uh, I couldn't work out why it was smoking. <laughs> I I lost my keys once and they were in the fridge. That, that's happened a few times. Like, um, like you, things you just don't realise what, what your brain will do to preserve like, your calorie balance is just a mental. Yeah, I mean, literally just start sort of diverting power to other to other areas it's like okay well you've taken this away so sorry brain you don't get to, you don't get to operate now and I, it's a very, I remember 
sort of sleepwalking through those last few weeks. I remember being in the gym too, and I'm a pretty level-headed guy. And somebody came up to me and asked, you know, how long have you got left with that? I was just like, fuck off. <laughs> just like, you got, I was like, whoa. I was like, yeah, dude, you better back off, man. Now, I'm not going to lie. It's true. It's weird, though. I think it almost sort of heightens those feelings because I can't stand it when people ask how many sets have you got left. I'm like, what? The only answer you want is I'm done. That's the only answer you're looking for, which you're not going to get. Just hover. Just hover around. But when I was in that kind of a state, yeah, all of those sort of ridiculous pet peeves came to the came to the surface, and that was fine. He understood. I think most people in the gym get when you're when you're that lean, you're going a little bit crazy. But yeah, you do you do not function as a human being. And I remember that last week, especially trying to do my job was just so hard. Get that last gym session could be the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Just I can't remember what it was now. We're just trying to pick things up, and then you do like three reps. It's like just put it down. If I can't, I've got to do eight. <laughs> you know, it's just the, oh man, it killed. But I loved. I look back now again, just massive smile on my face. I thought it was, I just thought it was great. I really, I don't know why. I just thought the whole thing was great. With you mentioned at the start of this about like realizing how much more weight you needed to lose than you thought, and I think this is something that every, particularly guys, go through in thinking yeah. they are. Like girls think they need to lose 20 kilos and need to lose five and guys think they need to lose five and they need to lose 25. And like, <laughs> like, how did you like, did you find that something that was quite hard to overcome? And if so, how did you get through that mental block? Because I've seen guys that like, I don't want to go below 70 and they'll self-sabotage at 71, 72 because they don't like that number. So how did yeah. you kind of get through that kind of process? Literally the, my PT mm. and trusting him. That was it. If it had been up to me, no way. No way would I have done it because I was convinced that you know, if you're walking around, I can't remember how much I weighed now, but let's say 13 and a half stone. And I would have been convinced that if you're walking around at 13 and a half stone, you're not a big guy. <laughs> That's what I would tell myself. 13 and a half stone, what a loser. But it doesn't make any sense because you could be, well, it depends on your height. It depends on the way your body holds muscle. Like, there's a thousand different ways that it could influence your influence your weight. But yeah, just um, I think actually I was more than that. But if it wasn't, that's why I always tell everybody you need a, a second person in this. You cannot, when you're going into that extreme, A, you're no good to judge, especially when you get to those last few weeks because you're now nuts. So you can't trust yourself. But also, you, you just have to have somebody else telling you what is right and what is wrong because it's so easy to convince yourself otherwise. Like I remember when it came to sort of, I can't remember what it was, but like, you know, we've got to drop all carbs now and go super low calorie. I may never have done that. Because I may have been like, oh, no, I'm allowed to have some carbs because they're nice. Do you know what I mean? Like, that, and I, I get that, you know, you know, I don't want to get the wrong information out there. Some people, of course, can, you know, rip up for a bodybuilding contest and they're still eating some carbs. You know, that's just that's just the way of it. But, you know, with my training, we needed to get past a certain point. So it was like, OK, we're going to strip this down now, too. So, yeah, it was just trusting the person that I had employed. I wouldn't have done it. I, I really, really wouldn't have done. And I would have walked on stage, yeah, way higher than than I would have would have uh, would have needed to. But it's just so hard. It's just an ego thing, isn't it? Or stupid <laughs> gym logic that you've come up with at your brain that you have to weigh a certain amount, which probably started with the whole, well, muscle weighs more than fat. Therefore, I want to make sure I weigh loads. I mean, that is such nonsense. <laughs> but I think that's how a lot, and me, myself included, I think that's how a lot of people think. You know, I'm a bodybuilder. I must weigh a lot of weight. No one knows what you weigh, man. Like, it's what you look like. And if you want to weigh 17 stone, just tell people you weigh 17 stone. That's about as far as that goes. So that, that's a rest, that's the wrestling fan coming out of you there, isn't it? Exactly, man. Just lie, just lie. Yeah. Wrestlers wear make it up all the time. So yeah, it was just having that support, basically having that support network and thinking, well, I assume this guy knows what he's doing. So I think by the end, I just stopped getting on the scale as a as, as you know, tied from sending in my my numbers. But in terms of mentally, just like who cares? Whatever. Let's just get this done. Yeah, like I, 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 I sometimes get that with body fat. I get a lot of people asking me when I when I put like um, photo shoot pictures up. They goes, "What body fat were you there?" I'm like, "I don't know." By the time yeah. by the time I got lean enough to see my abs, like they'll look better tomorrow. Yep, cool, keep going. Yeah, you know, no, totally. And, but the coaching is, I think, it's really important. I, I've, I've, I have done preps where I've I've gotten lean without it, but I always value the ones where I do because there'll be days where you'll you'll you'll, you'll be a bit flat, which is inevitability. The main ones know what flat means is when your muscles all will look like they're shrunk because like like you squeezed out a sponge the way I always look at it. <laughs> and if I that you know I, that could be yeah you do need a refeed or that could be no keep going it's part of the process you know you're gonna look small before you look bigger. But I know that if I was in charge of my prep, I'd be like refeed needed tomorrow. You know, every single time, you know, or like yeah. not progressing quick enough, let's drop calories more. And I just look really flat, the opposite, look really flat on yeah. stage. I think it's, I think it's a, it's a good investment. I've that second set of eyes, 
And the other thing as well, when it comes to a refeed, is if you make up your own refeed, you say Pizza Hut. <laughs> That's what people do. <laughs> they go, oh, I must eat a pizza now for a refeed. It's like, no, we're talking like maybe a handful of, I don't know, gummy bears or something. Not even that. But you know what I mean? Like a handful of rice or some crap. Like we're, not, we're not talking about you go eat some cheese and some bread, you crazy person. But that's the other thing as well. And you're doing that because you want it. And that's, you need someone to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. So yeah, I, I, I know some people do prep without it. If I was going to do it again, no way. I would get somebody on board. With them, um, like, Obviously, embarking on you were training a long time before you ever started doing the bodybuilding show. Was it was it was it the love of pro wrestling that got you into the gym? Was it was it that that sort of got you in? That inspired me. Yeah, I mean, it's Triple H. You know, Triple H in two thousand when he just had turned into this massive. <laughs> he went from being sort of a guy that worked out to just being this chiseled monster. Um, and it was it was two things actually. It was absolutely that. You know, they all like comic book heroes. I love comic book superheroes, Batman, Superman. And a mate of mine who was a couple of years older than me, he was going to this 18-year-old only gym, and I was 16. And he said, oh, I can get you in if you want. And so a 16 year old you're like, okay, my you know, 18-year-old friend wants me to go to the, you know, oh my gosh, the super exclusive gym. It just sounds like the coolest thing in the world. So I went to the gym and yeah, it sounds dumb, but I did a bicep curl and I just knew I just loved it. Like it just well, I don't know what it was the you know the the blood rushing to your muscle whatever the hell i was just like that's awesome i didn't know what i was doing for ages i remember i wanted abs so i'd mostly do sit-ups <laughs> that's when, thinking that's of course that's how you get sit-ups you do a bunch of a bunch of ab work and then i go home and eat haribo and and, and coke and it's just like no absolutely no clue what i was doing but yeah it was i think it was a combination of things it was wrestling it was the fact that i enjoyed it and as I've you know talked about in other videos, I, I was bullied quite badly as a kid. So the idea of sort of putting on some size and at least feeling intimidating or at least looking intimidating to others was just a nice idea for me. And that was kind of my get out of jail free card. I was like, oh, I get really big and muscly, then nobody will mess with me again. And I just loved it. I mean, that was the major thing. I just was so, so passionate about it to the point, yeah, you know, I went to university when I was 18 and I didn't drop, I didn't drink any alcohol because I was just so into going to the gym I was like, I don't want to do anything that could, you know, and it's, it's kind of, a, I don't think I would have done it anyway because drinking wasn't really for me, but it's a bad attitude to have because you can drink alcohol and be in terrific shape. But again, in my infancy of learning what the gym was, I didn't, it wasn't the fact that it could negatively affect me, but I knew it didn't positively affect me. So I was just like, well, screw it. You know, I only want to spend my money on things that can, you know, can help my gym stuff. So yeah, it really was one of those things that was like a light switch going off in my head. Um, it was really hard to find information back then. So I probably didn't really know what I was doing for a good few years, definitely way after university when finally you could actually, you know, get sort of information a little bit more accessible. But I just, it's, you know, I think some people are just chemically made to enjoy it, I suppose. And I'm very lucky to be one of them because again, oh, Miller, how do you, you know, stay motivated to go to the gym? It's not hard to go to Thorpe Park if you love roller coasters. <laughs> And it's not hard to go and lift heavy weights if heavy weights to you is the greatest thing in the world. So it was just one of those things that clicked. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that, that, a lot of that story is so much relates to me. I remember um, the, the only, well, the, the first and uh, last decision Channel 4 ever made to show wrestling after uh, the Royal Rumble 2000. And it was, it was that street fight with, uh, with Cactus Jack where I, where I saw Triple H come out. I was like, I don't even I don't even know. I think I've seen a little bit of wrestling before that at my, my grandparents' house. But like, that was the moment where I was like, I'm now a wrestling fan. And I can't even <laughs> remember why I was staying up till 1 a.m. to to watch the Royal Rumble. But that street fighting trilogy was like, that is how a man's supposed to look. And I was in year six, maybe year seven at the time. I was like, even at that age, like I'm I'm gonna grow up to look like Triple H. And I was, you know, with the you know, the unfortunately I I don't have the genetics, possibly the supplements, or I have hair that grows up. So, I mean, like, it's, it's not it's not happening. But, you know, like, I, I and I think at that time, similar to you, like, you know, very bullied in the early days. I think that's how a lot of people that love the gym sort of get into it. I think people who get bullied tend to either become comedians or bodybuilders. Yeah. Now they learn how we to outsize them. The most no, part. absolutely. Absolutely. So, and it's... It's kind of hard because I always push the fact you want to make sure that you enjoy the gym, but at the same time, yeah, don't don't do it out of spite. <laughs> I don't want it to come across that spite is a great tool, but also make sure you find the the exercise that that you're doing. I don't want anyone to think I was like, oh, I'm going to show those bullies. I was to a certain degree, but I did love it as well. So you know, there's plenty of things that you can you can do to do it. But yeah, I remember that that version of Triple H 2000 Royal Rumble is just that was the dream. <laughs> I mean, that was just the absolute dream. 
I mean, I was going to say, this, this, that would definitely be another podcast in itself is Doctor Who and that rabbit hole. But still, to this day, probably one of the best matches I have seen. Oh, man. So, like, yeah, I just, I, I, I just, I don't know. Like, it, it, it's something that can't really be done quite as authentically there. I don't know if it's because everything has just been so watered down because everything's been done. We get, we get three Hell in a Cell matches in a week now. And, <laughs> or, or we have to make an exploding barbed wire death match. It doesn't quite work, but um, I'm going to be lose every one of my audience if I keep going down this route. But, but <laughs> as we kind of go on to the wrestling, and I think it is, it's, it is important to know, like, a lot of people will get started with training because they want to look a certain way or they want abs in the same way that you did all those sit-ups. And often put people kind of lose that sort of like love for it after they kind of hit that goal. And often because muscle building is such a, it's such a slow process. You can lose half a percent to a percent of your body weight per week, but you're probably looking at a percent of your body weight per month. You're looking at a number of years before you build any muscle. So that brings us to almost you to how you transitioned into being a fan of pro wrestling into actually going and becoming a pro wrestler. So where was that? What was, where was that moment for you where you went, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't want to just watch this. I actually want to do it. And why was that? Well, I tried a few times, like throughout my sort of early twenties, I tried a, a few times. And for one reason or another, it hadn't worked out. Bad trainer, wasn't really feeling it, et cetera, et cetera. And then it kind of just got to a point where I was like, I don't know what happened. I have an epiphany of sorts. I don't know. But I was like, okay, you know, this is where we are in life. What haven't you done that you really feel like you need to do before it could be too late to do it? And one of those things was wrestling. So I said to myself, all right, I'm going to go to a school and I'm going to make sure that I keep this up until I have a match. And I just am very good at if I give myself something to do, sticking to it regardless. And that's what I did. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, just, that's just what it was. I realized that if I didn't take advantage of it now, not that I think there's any kind of age restrictions on it, but there becomes a point where... Younger than Batista. Diminishing... Sorry? Younger than Batista starting, right? Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. But it's the law of diminishing returns too. Like if you start wrestling when you're 28 compared to 48, you're going you're gonna to feel a lot better. So I thought you probably want to do it now before you could eventually end up in a place where you can't. And so I just said, that's what I'm going to do. You know, by hook or by crook, I'm going to have one wrestling match. I can, even if I don't really like it, I can handle putting myself through it. I just don't want to be an old man again, going, what if, what if, what if? And again, I'm lucky. I have a very, very stubborn brain. And as soon as I've decided this is something that I'm going to do, it's just what I'm going to do. It doesn't mean that I wasn't terrified. I remember walking to my first wrestling training session going, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? But I was like, you're going to do it, whether you want it or not. Like having this argument with my own head as I walk into the car. Um, and yet that was it. It just, I just needed to cross it off my list going back to what we spoke about earlier. And luckily, not only did I really, really enjoy it, but it sort of opened up this whole new avenue, avenue for me to, to muck around with. But yeah, I just think it was one of those things where you just sit down and you think about things. You're like, what do you, you know, what, what, what haven't you achieved that you want to achieve? Because that's what I do. I guess you give yourself a post-mortem almost. Then wrestling was that one thing that I'd loved ever since I was a kid. Maybe it probably did tie into the YouTube videos. You know, I've been doing that a few years now. So I thought, okay, well, that's done. What's next, right? Because I'm always looking for that kind of what's next thing. And it was, let's be a wrestler. <laughs> you know, did it have to be a good wrestler? Don't have to be a bad wrestler. Just be a wrestler. So if somebody says, do you wrestle? You can say, yes, I do. And yeah, that, that's what I did. And it was awesome. It was, it was, you know, it was great. Hopefully starting up again soon when the pandemic calms down. Um, but yeah, the amount of, much like the bodybuilding show, the amount of amazing stories and experiences that I've got from it are, well, you couldn't put a price on them. Like you really, really couldn't. It was that good. So when you obviously, like, you know, this, it's, it's, it's a completely new, new world to you doing it. And I can imagine an incredibly challenging process. What, what is it like training to be a wrestler? How is it, you know, how is it different from anything in training what you've done previously? Well, like I do, I do a lot of cardio, right? Because I think cardio is important because it's heart health, essentially, if you really want to break it down. And what's more important than that? But I was not prepared for the cardiovascular engine you needed for wrestling, which is essentially, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down constantly. So when you go to that first session, they give you sort of what they call the warm up which was essentially the most hardcore intense cardio thing I've ever done in my life. I remember my brain screaming at me, just leave. I don't care what they think of you. Just jog out the door and never come back because this is hell on earth. 
And, you know, trying to build up, like I say, that engine takes forever. And then you have your first match in front of a crowd and your adrenaline spikes for obvious reasons. So then you're even more exhausted and you're kind of in a rest hold trying to catch your breath, but you can't do it. So in terms of overall fitness, I've never done anything harder. Like, I'm not saying there aren't things that are on par with that, but in terms of my own, oh man, it's unlike anything else, which is combine that with the fact that throwing yourself on the floor hurts. You know, you really have to have a, you really have to be prepared for this stuff, you know, this stuff going in. And I didn't realize, not that I was in super duper shape, but cardiovascular wise, I didn't realize how good shape I was in until the pandemic did hit. And I kind of saw my cardio not getting worse and worse, but just balancing out a little bit. And even then I wasn't in the shape that I probably needed to do for wrestling. You know, I probably had a good 20, 30, 40% extra. I needed to, <laughs> I needed to add on, but I was slowly getting there. So there is nothing like it. And it really does give you a brand new respect for these people and almost sums up this idea of body image because you get the quote unquote fat wrestler and people, they haven't got a very good body. I'm like, I tell you, man, if anybody is in a ring going 10, 15 minutes, they are in tremendous shape. Okay, they're holding a bit of body fat because I guess that's just their natural way. They don't care about going to the gym or whatever. But, you know, you, you put them through some kind of health check, they'll come out with flying colors. Maybe they get told, okay, you could stand to lose a little bit of fat for X, Y, and Z. But there's no way their heart isn't in... In terms of, you know, that kind of exercise condition, you don't know what else is going on, obviously, when it comes to genetics or whatever. But just incredible, just incredible. And it's one of the reasons I'm terrified to go back because <laughs> I'm going to be a mess. I mean, I know that it will come eventually because that's how, you know, how fitness works. But I can't think of anything that would push anyone as hard as that. No, absolutely crazy. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I'm, I'm in awe of, uh, you know, the, 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 the guys that end up becoming pro wrestlers for that reason. Like, you were talking about, like, the, the, the heart health and that these guys would be mega fit despite the size they are like imagine doing that and having to move the weight of someone like keith lee or the yeah. big show and still doing the stuff that you're saying that is is you need another 20 30 40 percent for and like like that is that must be unbelievable absolutely i mean someone like john cena right big dude carrying a lot of muscle mass you know going to take a lot of oxygen to get to those muscles and then at the end of a 15 minute match he picks up big show on his shoulders and throws him on the floor <laughs> dude you are you are a specimen who oh, got he's on a bunch of steroids yeah probably irrelevant <laughs> he's an absolute <laughs> specimen like you we, we could all do that i'm not sure we could get to the end of the 15 minute match of the big show and chuck him you know that is a man that was born to to look and act a certain way but yeah that's it and it's almost a shame that people don't understand that but then people never do right you know when you watch a boxing fight no one understands the sheer intensity of a camp same with mma i mean it's the same with ballet right you know you go and watch those videos on YouTube about what a ballet dancer goes through before they do a performance and they wreck themselves. Like it's absolutely crazy. It's almost like getting ready for a UFC or an MMA fight, the, the sheer hell they put themselves towards. And maybe that's why they don't do it because you don't really need to see that stuff. But wrestling falls into that category. You know, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that has to go in in order to make sure that you're competent and ready to go in the ring. And it's not just about being a big jack dude, it's about having that, you know, crazy, crazy tank. I'll never really get, I don't ever think I'll be able to be in a position where, well, I, maybe I will be, but it just seems so out there right now, given everything we've gone through. I know that a lot of work is waiting on the other side, but it's, it's, it's tremendous, genuinely tremendous. Yeah, I, I think, I think it, is, it, it, it ties a lot of things that we've been saying this time about saying that people don't appreciate how hard pro wrestling is. And in the same way that we talked about people looking at the, 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 the celebrity physiques earlier on or, all the, the, the YouTube stuff that you were doing and just seeing the, the polished YouTube video or the, the six back yeah. abs or the pro wrestler and go, but that's not their life. You know, they don't see, I say, the setup of a Casey Neistat. They don't see the conditioning work that, you know, that, that a John Cena will have to go through or, or all the editing that you will have to go through for your YouTube channel. But everyone sees the, the finished article. I think if there's a lesson that's come from, from this conversation, it's like learning to love that process. It's the only way oh. to get you through anywhere. And understanding the process is going on. Nobody wakes up looking 5% and ripped. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen. And even if you want to convince yourself it's because they're taking PEDs, they're still eating right. They're still training right. They're still putting in the time. When it comes to photography, you know, it, it, they're still lighting. and it's still, it's still set up in a certain way, which is why really you can only do you at the end of the day. You do you. Make sure you get in the best shape as you possibly can. Try not to compare yourself to others and just see where you end up because everyone's going to have a different journey. It's why fitness is most you know, brilliant and it sucks because it's a complete trial and error kind of a thing. But yeah, never, ever, ever buy into that stuff face value. It's not worth it and it's only going to affect you and make you sad. And as we already established, nobody wants to be sad. <laughs>
<laughs> and like, like before, see, I don't want to take up the whole day. I could sit here and chat about wrestling and training. I was really just been there's been there's been tons of fun. But I'll leave you like a, a couple of questions just to sort of finish off. And the first one I think is like, as I, I as a, a boy growing up being into pro wrestling and comic books and all those things. There's another thing, there's another tick box I think that everyone normally like, that, that every young boy sort of wants to be. And that's being in a video game. You've recently uh, been announced for the virtual base of video game. How, how is that feeling to be announced for a video game? I, I haven't really processed it, if I'm honest. It's just stupid. It's just dumb. It's, it's, it's for so many reasons. One, I, I'm very much the, well, why do you want me in the game? <laughs> you know, what? You know, so maybe... I, I try and stay humble and I try I really really do try and stay humble so maybe there's something in that too but I mean I haven't seen a character model or anything like that but yeah just the idea that I could even be digitized and that's something that would be appealing to people how can you get your head around that like people still send me sort of create a character they've made in the WWE 2k games I'm like wow man like I know it sounds cheesy and over the top but that means a hell of a lot or when, even when someone just brings a sign to a raw with my name on it it's like what are you doing? <laughs> Why, what is wrong with you? Because <laughs> you just, I just can't fathom it. I just can't even process that I could have got to that point. But it's, it's, it's just humbling is the only word I can come up with. It's crazy. It's mad. If you had told me this, well, even if you had told me when I was a kid, Simon, you're going to grow up and one of your jobs is going to be re reviewing Raw or SmackDown. I'd be like, what does that even mean? I don't understand how that could be a thing. So the fact that it has then extrapolated into things like this, yeah, forever grateful, forever humble. And I love it. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of the things that, you know, going back to our earlier discussions mean more to you than, I mean, there's, there's lots of reasons to continue doing these things that we do. But I think those are the ones that really make you go, well, I must have done something all right. <laughs> because, you know, there's some kind of um, relationship here. So, I mean, it's just brilliant. And, and long may that kind of stuff continue. But yeah, I'm, I couldn't be more appreciative of it. And when I do first see myself in it, I may just fall on the floor because it's just going to be absolutely surreal. Yeah, um, I mean that it's it's. I think that was, from, if that was ever me, that'd be such a surreal like sort of moment to be able to see that because you know I've oh, I've, yeah. I've never been I've never been the good I've never been good at like WWE creator series. So if I try, I've given up trying to make me a new game. I just play <laughs> the people already there because it, it doesn't work. At least at least you can sort of play as Goldberg and just sort of say it's you for like up to well, now. Also, no I do, I I do look like every single video game character ever made called <laughs> Space Marine. So. In that sense, I'm very well catered for, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I'll, I'll go into a couple of... I've got to ask you a couple of wrestling questions before we get off the air, and then I'll, I'll finish <laughs> off with a couple of things that will, will hopefully go to the wider people that listen to more, which is probably more fitness and personal development related. As a person that reviews sort of Raw and SmackDown, and I think it's common knowledge at the moment that Raw isn't going through the best run. <laughs> if, if you had, if Vince McMahon gave you control of Raw today and you could change two things that you think would change Raw for the better, what would they be? Long-term storytelling would be the first one. I know everybody wants everything yesterday. I don't believe that. I think you have to retrain people's brains. But yeah, long-term storytelling where you plant a seed, you let the flower, the plant grow, and then you have a big payoff four, six, eight months down the line, whatever the hell that would be. But also just making sure you're reshuffling the, your deck when it comes to your main eventers and, and, and your roster. Like I love Drew McIntyre, I love Bobby Lashley, love Roman Reigns, you know, all, all these top guys, but I want to see fresh faces, you know, in, in, the, in the main event. I want to see, again, we mentioned Keith Lee, who obviously is off TV at the moment, but I want to see him given a chance. And um, there's a bunch of guys that won't even pop into my head now, but even someone like a Ricochet, right? I get he's not your quintessential WWE person, but let's just try it out and let's see what happens. And if we do fail, that's okay. At least you gave me something new. So yeah, they would always be my new ones. Just freshness across the board so it doesn't feel like i'm watching the same show every single week putting guys that maybe not even i'm necessarily a huge fan of that could prove me wrong in the main event but also getting them there by giving them some real good story stuff to sink their teeth into and as a secret third one getting rid of scripted promos not for everybody but to allow everybody to sink or swim and if somebody sinks put your arm around them okay here's what we're going to do and if someone swims you haven't got to worry about them anymore because they've proven that they can do it but a little bit more reality in my wrestling is never a bad thing and you're never going to get that when someone's written the words down on a piece of paper so yeah i think that kind of stuff yeah. i think long-term storytelling is a huge one i think i think one for me i think you know, so wwe is is actually letting people put on really really good matches i think the wwe style needs to go i think one of the things that i love about like in a way about aew is that 
everyone seems important because even if they lose, the matches are fantastic. So like yeah. you never get this thing where everyone just flattens out because it's like you get someone like Ricochet, for example, Ricochet, and then he he's in a chin lock and just doing a moonsault. I'm like <laughs> this guy can do eight rotations in the air and you make him yeah. do one. Like I, 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 I just I will never get it. Like you have the best cruiser, cruiserweight roster in the world and you didn't use them. And I just think that's absolutely mad. No, I so, agree. So we're like best. What's your like? If you had to like say your your favorite wrestler of the current day in any promotion, who would it be right now? Right now, oh Kenny Omega. Um, so instantly people say OUW oh, shill, which is not true at all. I <laughs> I love all wrestling, but I think in terms of a guy that can wrestle any kind of a style, has now proven that he can morph into multiple characters. Also has his ear to the ground in terms of what wrestling people are talking about. I mean, he gets video games. You know, he has this cool factor to him as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, has been involved in some of the greatest matches we've seen over the last sort of 10, 10 years. I think he almost has an extra allure to him because he was able to do that outside of WWE. And whether we like it or not, WWE has been the major American promotion for 20 plus years until really the last couple. So the fact that he's been able to sort of create this star for himself, to me, and also you could tell me Kenny Omega versus anyone and I probably want to watch that match. And I think that's a huge example of why he's gotten to where he's gotten to and i don't think he's anywhere near touching the surface either so yeah i mean there's there's loads of people in that conversation and they'd all be sort of biting at his heels but yeah kenny omega to me right now is he's number one he just is i just think he can do he just gets it right and when you hear him in interviews he's such a creative dude and he always again he always looks at things positively which i also think helps him you know in the way that he portrays himself so yeah absolutely i think he would absolutely be my number one i think i agree with you and and of all time of all time, it's Bret Hart slash Stone Cold in a very close second place. But I mean, Bret Hart's the guy that got me into wrestling. And over the last few years, and you know, this happened sort of en masse, people have gone back to his matches and gone, oh my gosh, these are amazing. <laughs> like they come across like real fights. But in terms of the showmanship, the pageantry, the sheer intensity about wrestling, I mean, Stone Cold Steve Austin, when I was, I was right peak age for him going nuts. And, you know, I remember him beating The Undertaker at SummerSlam 98 and jumping off my chair, like celebrating that he had won because how was he going to beat this dead zombie guy? And I think when you're able to capture wrestling in a bottle like that, you, you've won me over for life. So, yeah, that, I mean, there, there's other ones as well. You know, Match Man, Randy Savage, of course, Ric Flair. I mean, Ric Flair, I think technically probably is the best wrestler ever. But, you know, when you put emotion into it, these things happen. And there'll be a bunch of other people that I haven't even, you know, thought of right now. But in terms of me and how I got into wrestling and how I kind of view it now, yeah, it'd definitely be those two. Yeah, I, I, I probably would still say Triple H because I sort of stopped watching during the reign of terror. So I don't, I never had to experience <laughs> that. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and, and then, I mean, my my favourite growing up, and I think I'm not, I'm, I sh it's, 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 it's not the dumb thing to say Chris Benoit anymore, despite how unbelievable uh, he was, the you know, intensity was because of, because of the horrendous things that happened. But, and, and for me as well, I think it was partly because of how good his matches were, but also partly because the fact that he was the closest thing I could find to making, a, like in the old creator wrestler games, we just put random wrestler head, random wrestler body. He was the closest thing to like, Dark hair, my eye colour, didn't have a beard, so <laughs> yeah. I'll use it, you know. Um, so to finish off with a couple of actual, like, you know, actual topics on training and things like this, if you had to say that one thing that you see that people say maybe get wrong or mistakes they made with their training from your experience of all the things you've done, what do you think it is? I mean, I don't know getting it wrong, but not having the information to hand is probably not training muscle parts twice a week, right? Falling into that bro split of, you know, you train chest once a week, you change back once a week. And I look, the only reason I know this is because somebody told me to stop doing it and stop being an idiot. And that's because I had been told you only train body parts twice a week if you're a steroid guy. <laughs> I don't know where I got this information from, but it came from somewhere and I thought, well, that makes sense to me. So I'll just, you know, I'll just, I'll go on it. And I'm not a steroid guy. Internet disagrees, but I'm not a steroid guy. So I didn't train body parts twice a week. And then someone said, Simon, you really should train body parts twice a week. And they were like, look, if you train them once a week, it's 52 times a year. But if you train them twice, it's 104. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. And then when I started doing it, the the you know it was kind of I, I don't know if I was in a plateau anyway, but the sheer progress that I made was I mean it wasn't crazy. It wasn't like I woke up the next day like oh my gosh, but you know over six months a year, eighteen months, I really found my feet with it again. And then I also found talking to other people that they thought exactly the same way that I had. So I'd be like, no, 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 train, <laughs> train, but don't do this stupid. Well, you can do the bro split if you want, but you know push pull legs is always my 
you know, push, pull, legs, rest. I think when you start doing that, and if you want to do a bro split here and there, sure. But if you use that as your foundation, it just, it worked so well for me, which doesn't mean again, like we've talked about, doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone, but it works so well for me. I always feel like I need to push this onto other people and then they can do with it whatever the hell they want. But yeah, that's, that, that's the one because you know, a lot of people don't squat. Eh, I don't really think you need to squat. Like you should squat. You don't have to squat. That's not going to make a difference. But I truly think working legs twice a week, back twice a week, everything twice a week, that will change your training and fitness. So yeah, I, I try I try and throw that out there as much as possible. Also overeating, but overeating and undereating. Are like you going to get cut? No one's eating enough. And if you're going to get big, everyone's overeating. But I think, again, that's a trial and error thing. And I think most people that are smart enough realize it and they rein it in or vice versa. I think that kind of just comes with time. Um, and then obviously we, we've, we've spoken a lot about, you know, you want to be a wrestler, you end up having a match, end up in a video game, you want to do the YouTube thing, you ended up, you know, part of what culture and having your own channel and making a living out of it. And, you know, to go into the gym and become a bodybuilding, get on a bodybuilding stage. So when it comes to people that want to say, let's say professional development, same question as I just said about training, but if someone is just something a bit of advice to give someone who wants to better themselves in any goal they'd have. What's the thing that you think would stand out the most? It's not great advice, but it's the advice that I've always lived by. So <laughs> I have to go out there and it's a term borrowed from my good friends at Nike. And that is to just do it. Anything that I have found some success in started with me being adamant and terrified that I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> and then deciding, you know what? I'm just going to go and do it. And whatever the hell is going to happen. And then I took it from there. You know, it's just what you have to do because you can train and you can prepare as much as you want. But until you're in that environment, you don't actually know what you're going to need. So as long as I truly deep down knew that it was something I wanted to do, I just went and did it no matter what else was going on. I think that combined with the awesome Richard Branson quote, which is if somebody offers you something, or you know, if someone offers you a job and you don't know how to do it, just say yes, then learn how to do it. I think those two things <laughs> combined. So if someone says, oh, you want to do this? You think, I would like to do that. Yes, then just make that your life for six months in order to get up to speed. And I, I get that it's not great because most people are like, well, I already know that, but it's about pushing yourself over that line. And anytime I push myself over that line into an uncomfortable space, I know we get into kind of psychology talk here, but you really do learn a lot from yourself when you put yourself there which is why it's so important to do so, but also why you'll probably learn a lot as well. So that's why I tell everybody, wrestling, just do it. YouTube channel, just make it. We'll go to the gym, just go to the gym. And at first, don't know what you're doing. That's okay. It's not a problem. It's not, it's not a felony. It's not illegal. Some dickheads may yell at you, but they're the dickhead, not you. Trust me, no one likes those guys. So, and once you've done it once, you've done it. There's no debut. There's no, you, know, you, you will understand the good, the bits and the bads. So yeah, that, that's always the thing that I push on people, but I also understand it's not great advice, but hopefully in the moment when you are, you know, about to step in or step away, you'll go, oh, I'm going to step in and then it will all work out. Not always, but I kind of feel like when you do at least give yourself the chance to succeed, 90% of the time you will succeed. Doesn't mean you're going to become again, the rock, but you'll succeed in your own way. Yeah, I, that Richard Branson quote, something that I've always lived by. I think, you know, if, if, I, if, yeah. I, if I hadn't have got that I wouldn't have I wouldn't have taken my, my job in London I used to commute two and a half hours each way six days Damn. a week to work just because I like okay I can't afford a place in London but I'm gonna find out how I'll work it out down the line I'm in Hong Kong now that that came from doing like all right, let's, good, let's, yeah. let's, let's try going across the world I, I I like Chinese food let's just see what happens <laughs> <laughs> two, two years two years here and you know I, I love it I'll, I'll be on the I'll be on an island tomorrow I'll be you know I can go to the beach on Saturday it's like if I, and, and that would not be a life I would have been able to do to do other. Yeah. Well, this has been mate, this has been really, really fun. I've really, really enjoyed this. So for people who don't know where to find you, where do people find you? Uh, Instagram and Twitter is Simon Miller 316, which is a Stone Cold Steve Austin reference. Didn't know what my future held when I signed up for Twitter. Would have changed. It didn't. So it's a thing now. Yeah, all my fitness stuff is on YouTube. Just search for Simon Miller. If you're into my wrestling stuff, it's What Culture Wrestling. You search for it YouTube as well. But yeah, ultimately, if you hit me up on social media, you'll be able to find uh, all of my stuff. It's like a one-stop shop, but otherwise you can yeah, delve off into those two things. Fitness, wrestling, general nonsense, general tomfoolery, but hopefully with a good solid core at the heart or at least that's the idea whether or not i succeed i don't know <laughs> well thank you very much man this has been a little great fun thank you for the last like hour and a bit um great pleasure all good man thank you absolute pleasure